really just been encouraged in meeting a lot of you and hearing your stories. And um, it's nice to have a little more extended time sometimes for these types of gatherings. I have to fly in and out quickly without much of a context. But uh, because I've been able to be here with you and to share meals with you, um, it's just been a real encouragement to me to see and to experience and to learn about the work that you're doing uh, with veterans, with homelessness, with farming and caring for the earth, uh, in academia, in public policy. And it's just been a real um, encouragement for all of you planting churches and doing, doing the work. And I feel just uh, really humbled uh, to be with you and to be encouraging you in this way. I feel like those of us in the ivory towers of academia uh, have the privilege sometimes of thinking deep thoughts apart from, uh, and this is not, of course, the ideal. Of course, we want to be in connection with practitioners and want to be on the ground, but there is, at times, a tendency to remove ourselves from that work. And uh, whenever I get to sit down with people like you and to hear your stories, and of course, I'm trying to be involved, I'm very involved in the local congregation as well, but there's still a pull in academia away from that, and so I'm just uh, grateful to be with you and to, to in, in, some, in whatever small way, encourage you um, and empower you to continue to, to do that work. And so, I mean, the last thing I'll say is um, something that uh, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says a lot is that it's incredibly humbling just to have your work taken seriously. <laughs> um, and so, he usually says that when he's asked a question that he can't answer. <laughs> um, he just says, I, I, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, but um, that's, and that's easy to say for someone who's, you know, published 60 some odd books and whatnot, but Really, um, I still have to, I've got to give my book away, and I think it's Kate who is going to get it, so I've got that. But it really is humbling. I didn't come here to sell books, but I'm thankful that, um, thankful that the book was of some good, and I met a couple folks who had read it as well. So, again, enough uh, of those introductory comments, but again, just grateful to be here and humbled um, to be with you and to take us out. And so we are today going to continue the conversation, and I hope this will be... Um, in some sense, uh, a helpful rejoinder to yesterday. Yesterday was, in a nutshell, really problematizing place and kind of wanting to sit a little bit in the tension of seeing how geography really displays, how deeply segregation is woven into our, our cities and our communities and our daily lives. But thankfully, uh, exclusion and, and structural division is, is not the final word, right? And and the flip side of this is, of course, this idea that in the midst of segregation, in the midst of racial dot maps that can be very deflating um, and make it seem like the obstacles to reconciliation are insurmountable, in the midst of that, there are faithful people like you uh, working to transgress those boundaries and working to build communities across those lines. Um, and so I hope today will be um, a couple of things. One, um, we'll talk a little bit more about place and uh, place as a context for contemplation and why, why place might be critical for the, uh, the bedrock of communities. And after we talk about place or maybe woven into that, we'll talk about some contemplative uh, postures and practices related to place and we'll try to move into a conversation of saying, what does that look like uh, for communities of belonging to be a, a kind of prophetic response to patterns of exclusion? Um, how can we think about communities of belonging and what does that mean in terms of the identity of the church and our work and God's mission and so forth? So, so we'll try to do all that together in, in the next you know, 40 minutes or so, and then I'm going to uh, hopefully move us into a time of question and answer and, and conversation. So um, it's funny because I, before I read this wonderful Wendell Berry poem, an excerpt from a Wendell Berry poem, um, I can hear my wife in the back of my head saying uh, that me giving a talk on contemplation is a, is a funny thing to her. <laughs> um, it is a, a growing area. I think when David and I talked about this theme, I thought that's a a good confirmation that God's still doing some work uh, in, in my life. I think the short version of this is that um, some time ago, my wife and I uh, met at Regent College, and uh, we were taking classes and having very opposite types of experiences. I remember this class. Uh, I took Classics of Western Spirituality, where we read things like uh, The Interior Castle, Teresa of Avila. We read The Cloud of Unknowing. We read John Cassian. And I was reading this stuff, and I just thought, I don't know what is going on here. I just didn't have 
I think I didn't have the language or the posture, I didn't have the interior framework to really make sense of all this language. My wife was eating it up and just really just basking, I think, in the, in the glory of these great mysteries, and I was just so confused. You know, I thought, I think the, the activist in me was like, this feels like glorified navel-gazing. Shouldn't we just get out there and be pulling people out of ditches and so forth? And um, thankfully, you know, uh, my wife has been God's grace to me. Um, a few years ago, she came to a season, she is kind of um, an artist turned real estate agent, which is a funny thing. I think through the, through the years as a, an art major, she's an abstract oil painter, and so she's waitressed and worked in a, an optometry clinic and done everything under the sun, as a lot of artists do. Um, but she found herself in just this season of vocational angst and not just a sense of career, but really a, a deeper sense of what was God calling her to do in the world. And it just kind of led her to a season of, of dryness and... and um, and so she started seeing a spiritual director, and slowly but surely, um, an Ignatian director. And uh, I just saw it really uh, have a transformative effect on her life. And slowly but surely, she would meet with this director uh, about once a month, and they would just have these conversations, and she would come back and process. And I could just see the transformative work of the Spirit in, in her life. And I thought, man, I, whatever that is, I, th- I, need, I need some of that. <laughs> And so um, in 2015 or so, I was coming up on a sabbatical, and, uh, and she said, well, I really want to hold you to account to use this sabbatical as it's supposed to be, uh, um, f- not just for uh, a writing project and research that I had to do, but to say, like, she said, I'll give you two choices. You can either uh, uh, start to see a, th- a therapist to work on your, your uh, issues with your dad, <laughs> And, you know, and do counseling, or you can, you know, start spiritual direction. I said, spiritual direction sounds great. <laughs> I will uh, take you up. But um, as, as Providence would have it, um, her director's director, who had, uh, her director's director had, they'd been in a relationship for 20 years. He had a, a rare opening. He's a retired environmental attorney, uh, but had undergone spiritual direction with, uh, trained by a Jesuit priest for 20 years, and just uh, decide, prayerfully decided to take me on. And um, I was really grateful. And I think for the last three years, I've been meeting with him um, once a month. And it, is just, it has been uh, probably the most transformative thing in my faith in the last few years of just kind of trying to build in habits of making space for, for God to work. And maybe that seems surprising or, or, or not for someone who's supposed to be in the work of helping people to think about God and to live out the life of faith more deeply in the world. Um, and yet I found that these Ignatian disciplines of really simply cultivating uh, an awareness of the presence of God more deeply in, the, in my everyday life um, has been so helpful. And so I'm working on it, um, and I hope that maybe we'll, we'll get there a little bit and think about how maybe practices of place would help us to be present to God in those ways. Wendell Berry is someone who, if you're not familiar with his work, he is a, a farmer from Kentucky and uh, a writer, a poet, an activist, a Christian, perhaps in that order, or um, somewhere in there, I think he's someone who, I was introduced to Wendell Berry at Regent College, and I was like, who's this guy that people keep citing? And um, this is an excerpt from a poem um, a little over, almost 15 years ago, uh, How to Be a Poet, but I really appreciate what Berry says here about place and how it really is Um, his encouragement, a lot of his work is helping us to reconnect to the land and to think about the significance of how the land shapes our identity and really just getting us to pay attention to the fact that for thousands of years, uh, humans were very connected to place and connected to the land. And it's really only been uh, more recent developments in global travel and technology that have disconnected us from, from place and from the land. So... He starts off, and this is actually not the beginning of the poem, it's kind of a middle stanza, but he says, Breathe with unconditional breath, the unconditioned air. I don't know if you have spent time breathing too much conditioned air, like in a mall or on an airplane. Uh, We have the great privilege in the Pacific Northwest of having very wonderful, breathable air. Um, Sometimes you don't appreciate that until you go somewhere like Manila, or um, Beijing, where the, the air quality is not so great, and I, I take for granted the fact that breathing clean air is something that is uh, a luxury for many people in the world. Uh, he goes on to say that, uh, and so this idea of 
breathing unconditioned air is uh, kind of getting out into nature, appreciating God's creation, recognizing uh, the gift of breath. Shun electric wire and communicate slowly. I don't know if any of you ever feel like you're inundated with communication. Um, I get so m- I've gotten, I think, a hundred and something emails since I've been here. <laughs> I'm tr- trying to sort them all and respond to these messages. I really miss a time when communication was slow and deliberate, uh, when words were carefully weighed and chosen, um, and yet we're just flooded with uh, sound bites and news clips and text messages, and it just feels sometimes overwhelming. But perhaps this idea of paying attention uh, to the world, paying attention to our breath, communicating more slowly might help us to be attentive to God. He goes on to say, live a three-dimensioned life and stay away from screens. Uh, Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. Uh, Screens, by their very design, are intending to transport you to a different place or to fixate your attention in a two-dimensional way. Uh, Screens, I used to work in technology. I'm really grateful for technology. It does amazing things for us. But I have to say as well that the ubiquity of screens, and I think about my kids who are 10 and 7 and the fights we have over screen time. I try to pry devices out of their hands and get them to like run around and pick up a rock. Uh, these are challenging times. I think like I've got a, I still remember when my kids um, kind of growing up in a time, screens are wonderful. They had, my kids grew up Skyping their grandparents uh, not too far away. And so uh, from their earliest age, when my kids were like two and three, I remember any screen they would see, they'd walk up to it and start like swiping it and touching it. And if the screen didn't move, they were frustrated. Like, what's wrong with this screen? Like, why doesn't it respond to me? Uh, screens are, are great, but the, the ubiquity of screens has a way of dehumanizing us in some ways. It, it has a way of uh, making, a, 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 it's a wonderful tool, um, but a tool is to be used for greater purposes, not to be something that we develop uh, addictions toward, right? I, I walk around on our beautiful Seattle Pacific campus all the time, um, and I'm often guilty of like checking messages in between classes and walking and missing people. Um, a couple years back, um, it was in between classes, and we have, if you ever have the chance to come to our campus, there's this space in the middle of the campus called Tiffany Loop, and we have a, a grove of trees that were planted in 1890 by the Free Methodist Church, um, who founded our university, and it's a really va- apparently a very valuable collection of trees. We pay a lot of money to arborists to keep them healthy. Um, there's some kind of white poplar, which is extraordinarily rare, but they're uh, these really wonderful trees, but they're beautiful because they frame this common space where a lot of students pass each other. And on those rare months when we get sun in Seattle, um, it's quite beautiful, but oftentimes students are only out in, in the in-between moments. So there was a day, it was uh, early spring quarter, um, so the sun was starting to come through, and it was in between classes, and I was rushing through the, the loop, and I saw all these students, you know, busily crossing paths, um, and I saw one of my students just, you know, standing still in the middle of this crowd of others, and he was um, standing still with his eyes closed, kind of look, looking, looking up. And at first I thought, like, that's strange, like, what is, what's he doing? Um, and so I went over, I was walking, you know, I put my phone away, <laughs> I walked over to him, and I was like... Um, yeah, are you all right? What's, uh, what's going on? Um, and, uh, and he kind of, he opened his eyes and just said like, oh, I was, uh, I was just trying to take it all in. And I said, take, take what in? <laughs> and, he said, and he just said, look. And so I stood next to him and, and I looked up. Um, and there, uh, in, again, whenever the sun comes out in Seattle, people generally just wake up a little bit. But there was this beautiful moment where uh, the sun was breaking through the leaves um, and it was just real. it was gorgeous. It was this beautiful 150-year-old tree, but the sun, would, the light was c- coming just so, so you could see the rays coming down into this spot. Um, and, uh, and I paused just long enough to say, like, wow, that is incredibly beautiful. And uh, we, we shared this very brief, uh, kind of sacred, holy moment of saying, like, what a gift uh, to be alive uh, to see the, the beauty of God's creation and just to pay attention for a moment. And actually, that turned into like a half-hour conversation in my office uh, around what God was doing in his life. And so I think 
when we put screens away and we're paying attention to where we are, not only opens us uh, to the beauty, to the natural revelation of God in the world, but maybe opens us to others to pay more attention, uh, to be fully present with, um, with those around us who are also um, present to God. Uh, he ends the poem by saying uh, that there are no unsacred places, there are only sacred places and desecrated places. Uh, and what Barry is doing is saying that in some sense, we have been trained because of our busyness and because of modern technology and because of the world uh, to think that we live above place or apart from place. Uh, to think that place is just kind of the incidental location of somewhere we need, in between where we need to go. Uh, but Barry says that geography is never neutral, uh, but in fact, all places are, are sacred places and that all places reveal to us uh, the glory and sanctity and goodness of God and God's creation. Um, and so if we just pay attention to place a little more closely, we see, we see that coming through, and we also see the, the desecration of places where we have uh, neglected God's shalom. So I think this is um, just, I hope, an encouraging word to think about place and to think about place as the context of discipleship. There's one kind of a summary way to, with my students, I work on this to say that um, there is no community without proximity, and there is no proximity without place. And so those three things go together. And when we think about place, uh, not only does it require our just paying closer attention to those around us and to the world and to nature, um, but it is a way to think about how place is just the vital context where love of neighbor always gets worked out. It's the context of discipleship. And so if community is going to happen, it requires us to live life in proximity with others. And so by paying attention to place and proximity, um, that provides uh, the, the context for discipleship and for community. Okay, so with that said, um, if you're all feeling a little bit uh, contemplative about how to pay closer attention to place, we're going to for just a moment return to uh, Jennings, where we started yesterday. Jennings had a a kind of sobering, um, cautionary note around the, the depths of deformity and dysfunction in our modern world and how that can be a way of um, trying to take account of how deep and long the journey of reconciliation really is. At the end of the book, though, we've now skipped from the very beginning of the Christian imagination to the end. He begins to lay out uh, what it looks like in his kind of... Um, recommendation for communities who are wanting uh, to work through uh, some of these challenges in order to become a different kind of community. Um, and so he says that here that uh, in the end of the book, he's trying to invite people into thinking about discipleship as it's related to place. He says the identity is being formed in the space of, and sorry, I'm, there we go, in the space of communion uh, may become a direct challenge to the geographic patterns forced upon peoples by the capitalistic logic of real estate. A lot going on here, but he's saying essentially we have to work against all the ways that we've been pulled apart from the land, as Barry would suggest. Uh, we who live in the new space of joining may need to transgress the boundaries of real estate by buying where we should not and living where we must not by living together where we supposedly cannot and being identified with those whom we should not. Uh, for us in the racial world, the remade world, a crucial point of discipleship is precisely global real estate. The story of race is also the story of place. Uh, this encouragement at the end of the book is pretty much why I wrote uh, the book that I wrote. Um, it was Jennings' encouragement to say, if we understand that Christian discipleship is joining our life with God, if we understand that all belonging is rooted in our Trinitarian and Communitarian God, that that's where uh, we get our kind of innate longing for connection and desire for relationship comes from being created in the image of community. And if Christian life is essentially joining our life with God in that sense of divine belonging, and we're about to participate in that with the Eucharist later today, that this powerful metaphor for joining our life with God uh, requires us to think about our life in the world in different dimensions, and it requires this transgression of boundaries, both in real estate and in other ways, um, to think about belonging in new and radical and transformative ways. And so um, I've paired this um, 
I think, interestingly, with uh, an encouragement from Stanley Hauerwas. And so to kind of tie these things together, this is, I was talking with Nick about this yesterday, this is my own little mini reconciliation project between Stanley Hauerwas and Willie Jennings, who have any number of disagreements about things, but for most of you, which isn't too important at this point. But uh, this is a little bit of classic Stanley Hauerwas from the 1980s, uh, from a little book called Resident Aliens. Anyone read this by chance or long, long ago? Many of you are familiar with it, perhaps a really um, wonderful kind of pastoral reflection on the Sermon on the Mount and the social ethics of the Sermon on the Mount and what they mean for us being community, being Christian community in the world. But I love the way um, that these things, at least in my mind, fit together. This encouragement from Jennings to transgress boundaries and to form communities where we supposedly are not supposed to. Uh, And I think it it just fits well with this encouragement from Hauerwas, who talks a lot about this idea of the church as a, an alternative community. Um, and he describes here in the book that this, uh, he's talking about the most creative social strategy we have. Um, and in the end, he says it's not going to be innovative programs and um, catchy slogans and new models and innovations of, of doing community, although all those things have their place. He says, in the end, the most creative social strategy we have to offer is the church. Uh, the church, the life of the church, the constituted nature of Christ's body in the world. He says, we serve the world by showing it something that it is not, namely a place, a place where God is forming a family out of strangers. And so in cultural anthropology, this is the language of fictive kinship, to say that uh, what God is doing in the world is he's taking people who are estranged from one another, who are not kin by any blood or, or kinship definition, and he's making them into a community, a household, right? We, see, we hear all of Paul's language here of saying that God is taking people who really don't belong together, and he's knitting their hearts and lives into a community uh, where Christ is the head, where Christ is the cornerstone, right? He goes on to say that the gospel begins with a pledge uh, that if we offer ourselves to a truthful story, and the community formed by listening to and enacting that story in the church, right? And that's his description of basically what we're about, right? That's that's why we sing the the, the songs that we sing. That's why we read the scriptures and prayers that we do is we're just rehearsing and enacting and trying to inhabit that story. And we do that together as a community, and then we go out into the world and we try to rehearse it again, right? And we try to say, how can we think about all the ways that the gospel story pulls us into its drama and then invites us to see its, uh, its shape and character all, all throughout the world. And that's really how we're uh, trying to be a Christian community. Uh, he ends, of course, with some uh, Karl Barth um, and says, you know, if we can do this, we'll be transformed um, into, some, into a people more significant than we could ever be, have been on our own. And then he says that the church is... Uh, exists in the, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading back there. The church exists to set up in the world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way which is full of promise. And so I love this uh, tie-in from Bart as well to say that uh, this community of contradistinction which comes out of all of uh, this Anabaptist stuff that, and, and John Howard Yoder and the Mennonites and all the things that Howard Ross has been talking about for so long. But I love this idea that this community of contradistinction in the world is not one that is confrontational or prideful about its contradistinction, but it's one that is full of promise. It's full of curiosity and invitation and hope. Its strangeness, its peculiar nature is one that invites possibility and imagination. And this is where I think the imagination that Jennings encourages us toward and the kind of radical dissimilarity that Howard Ross encourages, these things come together in a really unique way and invite us to say, what does it look like to be a community that tries to inhabit uh, this way of discipleship in the world? And so a few postures and practices to do this, and then the rest of our time will really uh, just be examples, uh, because I think rather than explain it to you, I'd rather uh, give you the, the highlights of communities that I think are trying to embody this well. So a few quick notes Um, and then to the the best part of the stories of people who I think are trying their best to do this um, in real life. Uh, I think we've heard a lot about Sabbath and self-care already, but I just want to reiterate those common notes. Um, I am trying really hard to work on this, that 
paying attention to place is an everyday activity. Cultivating the presence of God is an everyday exercise. And yet Sabbath is such a crucial way of kind of stepping away and creating an intentional space to do this more deeply and more regularly. I love what Walter Brueggemann says about Sabbath. He says, Sabbath is not a a passive activity. Sabbath is intentional work stoppage, and it is active resistance to the incessant demands upon our life placed upon us by the, the mechanistic world of capitalism and the idolatry of productivity and all of the things that pull at your attention to say that you must work harder and produce more and give more of yourself. And Sabbath is this prophetic resistance to those impulses that says, God, you are enough and I am going to stop what I'm doing uh, because I need to trust that the work is not all about me and that I don't have to sacrifice myself and my own life on the altar. I think there's these false virtues of of sacrifice at times in in various genres, and I think it's been said, I've heard it said a couple times even in the past couple days, that activists sometimes have this proclivity um, to sacrifice ourselves, and that this becomes a virtue. And sometimes this is just poorly modeled leadership of saying, you know, we're going to work ourselves to the bone and that's going to be my, my virtue, right? Is it going to demonstrate how hard I'm committed to the struggle? Um, when in fact, I think that that can become a very self-absorbed and idolatrous process. And so Sabbath is something that pulls us away from that and says, God, I, tr- I trust you and I'm humble enough to recognize that the work is not about me and that if I take this regular rhythm of rest, there are opportunities for others to, to stand up and to, to take up responsibility, and there's also opportunities for, for God to work. And so I'm, I'm reminded uh, of, of where my trust ultimately lies. Um, Sabbath and self-care go together. I love what Parker Palmer says about self-care. He says that self-care is never a selfish act if, in so doing, we are stewarding the only gift we have to offer the world, which is ourselves. And so take care of yourselves, be with one another, take Sabbath seriously, it's a good uh, message for me to, to take to heart myself. Um, attentiveness to presence in place. We've talked about this already. Um, this is something, a simple prayer. Um, every month when my spiritual director prays for me and we wrap up, he says, God, help us uh, to be present to you as you are to us. Um, and so just as I described earlier in that running into my student in the, on campus, um, how can paying attention Uh, to God, help us to be present, uh, more fully present to others. I find that when I am able to take a Sabbath, I can go home and be present to my kids and my family in ways that I often am not. My kids, um, when they do an imitation of me, they they do this. You know, they're like, oh, Dad, you got to go into your room and close the door for a while and answer emails. And it's, um, it's easy to be with someone but to not fully be present. Um, And I think I I have to practice more and more an attentiveness uh, to God, which turns me toward others in a new way. Um, I have a former colleague named Jack Levison who's uh, done a lot of work in pneumatology. He has a wonderful academic book called Filled with the Spirit. The popular version of it is just called Fresh Air. And as a New Testament scholar and someone who's written a lot about pneumatology, I love this one image I have of his... um, where he just says that a good metaphor for us thinking about the presence of God and thinking about the Spirit is just uh, breathing and breath, right? And so we have these rich images um, in the Hebrew and Greek of the Spirit as as breath and wind. Um, I've heard numerous folks here describe how one of the beginning uh, postures of contemplation is to pay attention to our breathing. That, of course, transcends religious categories even. But I love the way what Jack Levison says, and this is, again, not unique to his scholarship, But he says that um, to think of paying attention to our breathing as paying attention to God is to say that God is as close to us as our breath. And the Holy Spirit is someone who animates us. And just as our breathing literally sustains us as we breathe in and out each day, when we pay attention to our breath, when we take a deep breath, when we slowly exhale... We are rehearsing an attentiveness to the life of the Spirit who animates us and who enables us uh, to be present to God and to others. And so I love just this idea of saying, how can we make more space uh, to pay attention to the work of the Spirit 
um, and to, uh, to make space um, in, in our everyday life to do that. Uh, the last one, creativity and imagination. I would love it if the church could make more space uh, for artists and for poets, for creatives, for people who just imagine things in a different way, who, who look at words and symbols and art and light and uh, the spoken word, who look at performance and dance and media and who just kind of see it a little bit. I don't know if you've ever lived with an artist or spent time with an artist who just kind of has a different hermeneutic for life. And I love what they bring. Um, unfortunately, uh, many of our ecclesial spaces have made artists feel like they don't belong, right? They've, we've often reduced uh, the arts to something somewhat contrived, something that is bounded in a particular way. I still remember my wife going off about Thomas Kincaid. Uh, <laughs> she, she grew up in an evangelical context where... Um, it's not that anyone ever said, if you don't know Thomas Kincaid, I think he's like this painter of light or something, the, the typical Kincaid painting is like this pastel mural of a cottage made of stone and a babbling brook and a sunset. And there's nothing particularly wrong with it, but Kincaid, I think, sometimes is like, to me, a symbol of what some, I guess, in evangelical spaces think like Christian art is. Like, this is very, um, a kind of pastel pasture of of water and peace, and my wife would say, that's not art. <laughs> there's nothing authentic, there's no authentic expression in Thomas Kincaid. And I said, God bless him, whatever he's doing, I'm not sure, it's not meant to be a condemnation of him as an artist. I think it's just to say that when we make space for the arts, I believe that the Holy Spirit is the great reconciler and the great inspirer, right? I think inspiration comes from the Spirit, and we need artists and prophets and other people to say like, hey, Let's think about this a little differently. Um, how can we make space for the arts? Uh, last thing I'll say about this, I love that um, Daryl Guder, a theologian from Princeton, you know, I, I'm going to borrow, I, this, I can't find, I've asked my librarian to find this original quote, I don't know who said it, um, but what we need in the church is not necessarily more theologians, we could use a few more artists. He says that theologians are like manure, um, he says, spread thinly across the soil, it's good for the earth, but piled all up together, <laughs> it stinks like a pile of manure. Uh, you get the idea. Um, so I would, I would love it if more artists and more creatives found their home in the church, and I think we could use a, I think all of you are theologians to a degree, I think we could use a few less, well maybe not a few less professional theologians, maybe we just need to spread ourselves out a little bit more. Um, okay. So what do these practices look like in the world? Um, there's a lot of different ways that this happens. Um, I'm going to go, gosh, I've, I've saved the best for last, and now I've realized I haven't managed my time super well, but I want to give you some examples. We have a long-ish video to watch, and that's why I'm going to try to set this up. But um, there are a few communities doing this, and these are just examples that come to mind. These are spoilers from the book. Um, I'll try to give you some other context for, this is my, my home church. Um, I think of them as a community that tries to embody a lot of these things. It's a very imperfect church, like all churches. Sometimes I think these stories recorded in books tend to kind of lift up all the wonderful things and hide or, or not intentionally, but just overlook all the hard and difficult and really mundane things. And so I just want to say one day I'll, I'll ask somebody to write a story of all, about all the failures, not all the positive examples of people who are doing it perfectly. Rainier Avenue Church is a... a Medium-sized Free Methodist congregation in the Rainier Valley, a very diverse um, church in an urban neighborhood in South Seattle. But what I love about RAC um, is RAC, as we call it RAC for short. Um, it is a place where I have just found um, an invitation uh, to root somewhere, and they have been on the same street corner for about 110 years. And my favorite part of narrating their history is that uh, during a time of transition around the neighborhood in the 1970s, uh, the neighborhood had uh, been evacuated by white flight and economic downturn, and a lot of people were leaving, and new people were coming in. And because of it, the church through the 60s and 70s was predominantly white. Um, and as the neighborhood was changing, they just began to lose members. People were moving out, and also um, people were moving away. Uh, Boeing, which had been a major employer in the area, had faced some economic hardship. Um, and so the denomination reached out to them and said, I think that maybe you all should just 
kind of close up shop. I think that the time has come. They were having a hard time um, calling a new pastor. And so they had dwindled down to a group that was uh, very old um, and very frail and kind of seemingly in its last stages of life. And so uh, the regional superintendent said, I think maybe it's time you know, to, to celebrate what God has done, but to move on to a new chapter and to follow where people are going. It seems that people are leaving and um, these older folks in the church, about a dozen individuals, wonderful people with wonderful old white names like Leonard and Edith and uh, <laughs> Doreen and Chuck and all these uh, wonderful people who are now the, the elder states people of our church, um, and they're now in their 80s at the time, uh, you know, they were um, not, gosh, how old would they have been at the time? Some of them have, have passed away. All to say, they were, these were, they were not young at the time. They were in their, I want to say, early, early 60s. Um, they were, you, you could chalk it up. Some of them joke that this has become lore that's maybe out, like, outgrown what has actually occurred. But I think they're really just um, in humility trying to not take the credit for this story. But in a combination of stubbornness and maybe paying attention to the Spirit, they said, uh, we don't want to close. Uh, we actually think that God's not through with us, and in spite of the way things look, that this neighborhood's going into you know, decline and whatnot, we think that God's not done, and maybe he wants us to actually stay on this street corner for a very distinct purpose. Um, and so they did. They actually got into a conflict with the denomination. Eventually they said, they said, well, you can actually, we will leave the denomination then if you don't want to call us a pastor, and we'll call our own pastor, and we're going to stay right here, and we'll fight you for the building. Um, and the denomination was like, okay, we don't want, we don't want that. We don't want to fight. Um, but they, they stuck it out, and in their stubbornness and attentiveness to the Spirit, um, they stayed there, and in the midst of transition, in the 70s, our community was receiving a whole bunch of refugees from the Vietnam War. And so people from all across Southeast Asia, from Laos and Thailand, from Vietnam. And uh, so a representative from an organization called World Relief, which does a lot of refugee resettlement in western Washington, came to the church and said, uh, we have some uh, families from Laos, um, some Lao and Thai families that we would love for you to resettle. Um, they are coming to this community would you help to resource them? Would you help to surround them, to teach them English, to help them to get housing and documentation? And uh, these families who were kind of on their you know, last legs said, well, I don't know where that is on the map, and I've never heard of those places, those people. I don't know what that requires, but yes, uh, we'll do it. We'll try. Um, and so they welcomed these families in, and long story short, uh, they, they stumbled their way through it, but really just offered a very genuine and compassionate hospitality. And today, the children of those families are um, ordained elders in our church um, and have become just vital parts of our community. And I love that they weren't just welcomed and then sent on their way, but they were welcomed in such a way that they were introduced to the Christian faith and said, like, this is a place I feel like I belong. Um, and it became home to them, um, and they've stuck around. And so since then, we've had just uh, the relationships they've made with other Southeast Asian uh, refugees and immigrants in the community have given our church a real um, deep connection to that community and has made um, our church a place of hospitality. It's made our potlucks a lot spicier and a lot better, <laughs> um, and really just given us um, a wonderful way to say, like, how can we be this kind of weird community together where we don't often share the same language and background, um, but we come together on a Sunday and throughout the week, um, and we share a common life and a common faith. And so um, I love that international aspect of our community. This uh, really briefly is, uh, in this middle photo here, is our, one of our, our um, kind of uh, musical teams. They, call them, they, have a, they have a name, and when I first saw they had a name, it's kind of funny. They call themselves the International Praise Band. And I was like, what's, what's up with your name? Like the other teams, I'm on the rotation monthly, and we just come in and play. Uh, but they had a name, and I thought, why do you call yourselves that? And as I met them, I thought, oh, that actually makes sense. Uh, but it gives you a good snapshot of our church. So kind of starting with Stephen with the glasses and going around um, counterclockwise. Stephen um, is a Japanese, Brazilian, American missionary kid um, who speaks 
English, Portuguese, and Japanese in that order. He's a public school counselor, but he found a home in our church because he was a Seattle Pacific student, um, and he uh, found himself at home in this very mixed community. Next to him is uh, Marissa Yukasako. She is a Thai Chinese missionary kid um, who is ethnically Chinese but raised um, in Chiang Mai on the mission field, came to the U.S., found a home with, uh, in this rich Southeast Asian community. Uh, next to her is uh, Kyla Nisimbi, who's married to Ken Nisimbi behind her. Kyla is African-American. We joke that her dad is the unofficial mayor of our neighborhood, but she has been in the community. She's like a third-generation Rainier Beach uh, community member and resident. Uh, I guess to move back, since I mentioned her husband, Ken and Mark behind them are, um, Mark is our community life pastor. The Nisimbis are evangelical Ugandan Christians born and raised in Nairobi, who then came to Asbury, Kentucky, and then to Seattle. So they are, uh, the, their family is like the first family of our church. Um, they've, we have this, in addition to Southeast Asian immigrants, we have a lot of East African uh, migrants and, and um, immigrants from our, from our community in our church. And so the last guy, the token white guy there on the right, that's Justin. Uh, Justin's actually a Dutch Afrikaner from South Africa, and so uh, they together uh, make beautiful music, and it's not just, um, what I love is that in their music, they don't just, nothing against like hill songs or, or uh, you know, <laughs> hymns or what, all the wonderful songs we sing, they, they write their own music and they all bring a lot of their cultural influences to the music that they play, um, and they sing in a lot of different languages that are sometimes challenging for our congregants to sing. Um, not just English and Spanish, but also, uh, you know, Kiswahili and other, um, sometimes, we've tried some Asian languages, it's tough, it's a little rough, but, um, yeah, uh, anyhow, it is really just this really fun mixture of us saying, like, man, we don't, I look around on a Sunday at Rack, and I think the best thing I could say is that I have no idea what we're doing together. Um, in addition to it all, we have a community called Center Park where a lot of adults with disabilities live and they come and join our community. We're high on participation. Um, and, you know, it's a very strange Sunday experience. I say that there's nothing particularly about, um, you know, nothing especially well put together all the time that makes our church really stand out. But I love that I come and I sit and I look around and I think this is a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Um, and we, we don't share a lot in life, but, on, but RAC serves as a community where we do share a lot in common. So uh, more, I could say more, but I'm going to keep going. Um, okay, this is taking us to the video. So this is a kind of long video. I think, we have, I think we have just enough time for it, and we'll have to wrap things up with maybe a brief time of Q&A. Um, this is Bob Ekblad, and I'm curious. There's a lot of Regent folks in the room. Is anyone know Bob Ekblad, or you're familiar with his work? Anyone have courses with him? Bob's an interesting person. Uh, I'll just put it that way. He is super interesting. Uh, he is also an SPU alum, uh, and he is uh, an Old Testament scholar. Uh, my favorite book of his is called Reading the Bible with the Damned, and it's basically just, yeah, his, <laughs> yeah some fans. Um, it's basically his perspective on doing Bible studies in jail, and just kind of reading Jesus' parables with the incarcerated, having a, providing a very different view on you know, his work, giving him a different kind of theological education. Um, I want to show you the video because it's long, but I would happily cede my time to a bit of Bob's story. I think he's someone who embodies a lot of these ways of belonging, um, and it comes out of his own journey. And so I'm going to, the video describes, we're, we're going to skip a little bit, it starts at about two minute mark. But it is a story of his transformation and a story of how he is really trying to bring together all these different interests. And so I think maybe I'll just let the video speak for itself and then I'll, and then I'll pick it up. But I'll say just um, one thing about Bob. Um, he often narrates his story in kind of three conversions. And we'll see if you can pick this up in this you know, 14-minute or so description of what Tierra Nueva is and what their ministry is. He talks about being uh, born again in an evangelical context. Talks about then being born again from below, uh, from his time in Latin America. And then his third conversion, he says he was born again of the Spirit um, in this somewhat interesting, um, but as you'll see in the story, uh, really providential, charismatic conversion to the work of the Spirit in his life. And 
a spiritual renewal, be really being a kind of breakthrough point uh, in the ministry he was doing on the margins with people. And so I'll let Bob speak for himself, and then we can think about what it means for us together. I felt called to go on this journey through Latin America and letting myself be affected by the context of oppression and poverty. Ended up in Guatemala in the midst of a full-on civil war. It was right in the middle of all that that I thought this is what I want to do for my life, is, is respond to the, the underlying issues of, that lead to civil wars, that lead to oppression and I want to do it with my girlfriend. So I, I called my girlfriend Gracie from Guatemala, from a phone booth on my 23rd birthday and asked her to marry me, and she agreed. A month later, I was up at home. A couple, like a month after that, we were married and back in Guatemala. Um, we spent five months in Guatemala studying Spanish, and uh, we traveled all through Central America at, looking for places to plug in and work. So we went to this guy's model farm and it was amazing. And this guy, he said, you know, if you want to combat the roots of poverty, you have to teach farming. Started with Don Fernando being our coach, our trainer. Uh, we started farming. We chose a piece of land that was exhausted. It wouldn't even grow weeds practically. It was so over farmed. We began farming using these methods that Don Fernando had mastered of uh, farming to the contour, composting, refusing to burn. People began to visit us like, daily, serve them coffee, and they were like, so how did you do this? And we'd say, we don't really know, uh, Fernando, you know, go talk to him, and let's go talk to him. And Fernando would be like, no, uh, the gringos, they, they're the ones who know everything. I don't know anything. And we're like, no, we don't know anything. It's, the, it's Fernando. Our role became like supporting Fernando and taking all of his knowledge and crafting a course. As we began to farm and visit people, our hearts just, uh, became uh, softened and broken, really. Three years, that's all we did is just visit people. We watched the program go from 12 to 75 to 200 to 1,000 families working with us. Gracie was teaching sustainable, uh, like nutrition and gardening and uh, hygiene with Catalina. And that's when one of the leaders of the community said, hey, Roberto, you know, could you lead us in a Bible study at the beginning of every agricultural meeting we have? every Saturday. Most of us are Catholics. We know nothing about our faith. And this will maybe soften some of us who are really rough and make us more humble. So I was like, wow, okay. And that's how we got into reading the Bible with people. I shall go first here. It's been a privilege to have President Suazo of the Honduras, a friend of the United States and a friend of democracy here for a visit. We've had very useful discussions during which both of us expressed our satisfaction with the positive relationship that our two countries enjoy. The U.S. was doing covert activity activities, you know, funding death squads, supporting death squad activity where they were targeting activists, including Christian workers. And uh, I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people that lost their lives in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. We were hearing all kinds of stuff. And Gracie and I would spend a month of every year, um, or three weeks back in the United States. We'd go to Washington, D.C. We were speaking out against what the U.S. was doing in Central America. During this whole time, when we would travel in the United States, the evangelical and charismatic churches would always be promoting the Reagan and Bush administration's policies and always dismissing everything we had to say. We'd speak in churches and people would just, you know, would just oppose us. So we were just getting more and more frustrated and feeling quite antagonistic towards the United States. And uh, it was in that period, this door opened up for us to move to France and study theology in a, in a Huguenot seminary and uh, we're just welcomed with, you know, just treated so nicely by these French Huguenots. And it was uh, there where um, Gracie and I both felt called into the church. We'd been outside the church pretty much doing all this with people outside the church. And in France, we felt called to be pastors and called back to the United States. We were aware that 
that the Skagit Valley had a huge immigrant population. We learned that there was no one doing full-time ministry with this population. And so in 1994, we, we moved up to Burlington and started Tierra Nueva. So Tierra Nueva, you know, our focus was the jail and then gang members that we were dealing with in the jail and then outside the jail, and then immigrant families that we were visiting in the migrant labor camps. And we started a Bible study here too and began to meet with people every week and we just built up this ministry. We got this big grant and the first check came in right at the beginning of September 2001. A couple days after we got the check, 9-11 happened. This was just a, a devastating impact, you know, on our on our ministry. I mean, as soon as 9-11 happened, what we noticed is this flags everywhere, sentiment of fear uh, of nationalism, and this attitude of fear towards immigrants. We had a lot of people that just uh, stopped supporting us. Around the same time, methamphetamines were hitting our county, and a lot of young people, and a lot of our people we knew were just being uh, caught up in in addiction to meth and people just coming in looking like skeletons and losing their teeth and it was just like oh man this is a scourge but it felt like our gospel was not really impacting that uh, that scourge and so around that time gracie and i just went through a period of just soul searching that lasted for a couple years where we were just like increasingly desperate like we read the stories of jesus healing the sick and driving out demons and and just healing everyone of every kind of affliction. And Jesus was putting us in crisis, like, like, Jesus, yes, you know, so beautiful what you did, but like, what's up with us? Why don't we see the breakthroughs that we see in the gospels, like here in Skagit County, like we wanna see it. My wife, Gracie, was like very burnt out. Catch the Fire Conference in Toronto was being promoted by my brother. And I said, man, maybe you should go to that, Gracie. And so she says, well, maybe. Anyway, she ended up going. It was a, a real powerful experience for her. The night she came back, I, I was complaining because, you know, I just, my nostrils, I'd never been able to breathe through both of my nostrils my whole life. And, so I'd wake up with dry mouth and I was just kind of mentioning something and she said, well, you, you should go to the doctor and really check that out. And then she's, well, maybe I should just pray for you. I was witnessing that happening in, at this conference. So she reaches over, prays for me and uh, my nostrils like opened up. So I was like, I slept through the night, breathing through my nose for the first time in my life. So that was pretty, pretty significant. So here Bob is, on an airplane, headed to the charismatic revival movement known as the Toronto Blessing, or Catch the Fire. January of 2004, I flew to Toronto and went with my uh, brother, another brother who's a Presbyterian pastor, to this leaders' conference. The leader of this movement gets up to the microphone and says, hey, I just want to welcome all of you, and I... How many Americans are here in the audience? I like to invite all the Americans to stand up. And he says, you know, I just want to welcome all you Americans and let you know that not all of us Canadians are against what you're doing in Iraq. Some of us are just really glad that you are the world's global police force. Let's give the Americans a round of applause. Okay, so I was like, oh. I sat down and I was just so disappointed. I'm seeing a guy praying for people down to the left of the line. And uh, I'm looking down and I'm watching them falling after he prays for them, you know, being overcome by the spirit. So I'm thinking, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna be slain in the spirit. That's no way. Like, uh, what if I catch some kind of a right-wing Republican anointing or something like, I just, I don't wanna like lose control to them. I'll lose control to the Holy Spirit, but not to these people. So I'm just, but then I'm, I'm praying, okay, Jesus, I trust you. And I was praying the Jesus prayer, Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, which is something I prayed regularly. And the guy gets to me and he's this British guy, like 25, barefoot, really humble, 
just puts a hand in front of me and I feel someone touch my back like the catcher. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to fall down. You don't need to worry about that, I'm thinking. So anyway, the guy says, um, I see you in a circle of men in red uniforms sitting on blue plastic chairs. I think they're prisoners. And I hear the father saying, I love how you love my prisoners. And I was like, whoa, okay. Like that's who I read the Bible with, people in red jail fatigues, sitting on blue plastic chairs in the multipurpose room of our jail. That's what I did week after week after week. I've been doing that, you know, for that point, 10 years. And uh, my heart had been broken by it. And here's this charismatic guy telling me that the father sees, loves how I loved his prisoners. That, that got me right in the gut, right in the heart, okay? Then he says, and I hear the father saying, I'm going to make your heart burn as you read the Bible. And I'm going to give you revelation that will make their hearts burn. And that's my favorite scripture, the Emmaus Road, you know, where Jesus opens the scriptures and they say, didn't our hearts burn when he explained the scriptures to us? And so like, that's exactly what I wanted is to, is to grow in that area. And so I was like super shocked that this guy was prophesying so exactly. Then um, he, has, he, has, he has my full attention, right? And I feel known by, by Jesus directly and addressed by, by God directly. Then he says, um, and now the Father's saying, he's gonna give you an anointing for healing so that your words will be confirmed by the signs that follow. As soon as he said that, I just remember thinking, no, but it was too late, I was falling. And I lay on my back on the ground um, with my hands just on fire, feeling like they were just like burning. That next day I flew home thinking, okay, I, uh, wow, I've had this experience. I wonder what's gonna happen, how it's gonna, you know, how I'm gonna just adjust to my life back at Tierra Nueva. I remember coming home and my head was still like, felt like I had like warm oil covering my forehead. Came home and I just felt like my whole heart had just been tenderized. Like I went over to my dad's house and just asked him to forgive me for holding resentment and told him how much I loved him. And, and I began to experience like every night uh, feeling God's presence just washing over me like big waves, wake up in the middle of the night, just shaking. And so I had to pay attention to this, what was happening to me. And I didn't know what to do with it. In the jail, um, well, I had a whole room full of guys, like white guys who were kind of, one of them was a real neo-Nazi guy, big, tall, six foot seven, heroin, ex-heroin meth user, a guy named Zach. And like half the room, like seven or eight, nine guys were all Latino gangster gang members. And I had done a Bible study about discrimination. And at the end of it, I said, how should we respond? And Zach had said, we got to pray for, for Fabiano, that God would heal his effing liver. Fabiano had been crying every night because of cirrhosis of the liver and all this pain. And, and I was like, Fabiano, do you, do you need prayer? I mean, do you want prayer? And he, he was a really humble guy, he nodded. And I knew Zach had a liver problem because his hands were swollen like twice their normal size. And so I said, well, Zach, um, if we're gonna pray for Fabiano, maybe we should just include you too and pray for you. And he was like, no, you know, I'm just a selfish guy. I just think we should focus on him. And I said, okay, but let's pray for you too. So we let me, we prayed for both guys. And I, I never prayed for anything like that. I put a hand where I thought their livers were and I just said, Jesus, I just asked for you to touch these guys and come back a week later and their symptoms had disappeared. You know, they, they'd been pain-free. And so that was like really powerful, like to see that in you know, such a humble way. And I began praying for people and just seeing God heal people on a weekly basis in the jail. And then people would want to give their lives over to Jesus, like in response. And I wasn't used to really signing people up, like getting them saved, so to speak, like all that language was, but they were, all the people were wanting that. So I began to pray more deliberately with people if I, you know, in response to their requests. In our ministry, God is doing a work where word 
you know, the scriptures, reading the scriptures for good news uh, at the margins, you know, for the poor. Spirit, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, and street or, you know, justice, advocacy, peacemaking, confronting the powers, standing with the, the downtrodden. Those three pieces we feel called to really champion uh, together in a united way. Like, And we see that the places of deepest brokenness and marginalization everywhere in the world require a united body of Christ. And, and so we're, we feel called to a ministry of reconciliation. And there's a need for repentance on lots of fronts. Like we need to repent of all of our judgments, harsh judgments against evangelicals and charismatics. And churches that endorse the status quo need to you need to repent of that and be about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And so without that happening, you know, we're going to just see increasing division and, uh, and ineffective ministry because uh, the body of Christ in North America isn't going to be trusted around the world. And, and without that, people aren't going to have the tools and the, uh, the mindset and the, you know, the anointing that they need to be able to see the chains broken off of people and the captives being set free. Um, like I said, we, I, I'm pretty much out of time, I, but would happily cede my time to Bob and his story. I know that was a long video, but I just think it's such an amazing story. There's a few different versions of it that he tells. Um, I would highly encourage you to look up Bob's work or to support the work of Tierra Nueva. They, um, just incredible community, and I really, uh, Bob is a really humble guy. I don't know if you can... Uh, sense that he, it's rare to meet someone who um, goes through a powerful charismatic conversion kind of experience um, and yet has still retained a lot of who he's still very much uh, an activist, an academic, a missionary, a farmer. He's all these things kind of rolled into one. But I love this uh, sense of desperation in his ministry of anyone who's working in hard places like many of you are uh, comes to a point of fatigue and comes to a point of of just really needing um, inspiration, really needing a, a fresh and new touch from the Spirit. And so I love the openness with which he came. And he, he often describes that Toronto airport conference as like, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, and then just being blown away by surprise. You know, what a surprise um, that Christians in our own, or sometimes maybe a degree removed, we think of them as like distant cousins, uh, may also have ministry to offer to us, and there's gifts that we bring together. Um, I think I'm just going to end because, in some ways, there are more. There are so many more stories I could tell, but I've I've gone over on time, um, and so I think instead of um, kind of going through the rest, I'll leave it to you. You just got to buy the book. Uh, you have to read the rest of the stories there. There are other other people in there, uh, but I just love the the word that Bob leaves us with. Uh, which is kind of this convergence of paying attention to the Spirit, paying attention to place, wanting to be involved in the lives of people on the margins, and just discovering what happens uh, when we kind of place our lives on these dividing lines. And there are just um, remarkable um, stories of belonging and stories of reconciliation happening with uh, the work he's doing in the jails, with migrant communities, with former gang members, with former drug dealers. Um, and it is not all easy. Uh, I think Bob would be the first to say that he's made a lot of mistakes and it is not um, miraculous healings every day. Um, there are those great high moments of God revealing himself and the Spirit working, and there are lots of really low, hard moments um, of being in the trenches and of being disappointed um, and in being frustrated. But I think it's in those moments when we... Uh, surrender to uh, the Spirit where we see uh, the miracles of God's kingdom break through. And that's, that would be my prayer for you, is that you would, in that mix of attentiveness and contemplation and struggle and solidarity, uh, that you would make space for the creativity and the imagination and surprising ways that the Spirit is at work. And so I hope that's an encouragement to you. I think we're out of time. We're definitely, I'm, I'm over on time, but um, I really thank you for uh, just your attentive ears and um, yeah, and I want you to be blessed and encouraged. So thanks a lot. Thank you.